Yep, right. Good evening to everybody here from uh, Georgia. Beautiful weather, very hot. An ideal climate in some ways for a British person because we were so used to the rain and the fog in England that it was a delight to walk out into the sunshine and you can do that day after day after day here in Georgia. And it seems that the questions about the Bible are never ending and that's as it should be. People are inquiring. Around the world we're finding former Jehovah's Witnesses, former this, that and the other, Christadelphians even, and others who are questioning some of the fabric of what they've learned in church and this makes for interesting conversation so let's see what's on your mind okay this afternoon so we go with do you believe in original sin uh, yes you know the Bible really doesn't I think make such a fuss about that as we have in, in, in certainly in Calvinist theology Paul simply says that all have sinned and that sin has come through Adam to all of us because all have sinned. He doesn't go beyond that. You're born into a world which is under the influence of the devil. Revelation 12 verse 9. The devil is deceiving currently the entire world, proving of course that our millennialism is false because in Revelation 20 the devil will no longer be able to deceive. That hasn't happened yet. So in that fallen world into which we're born, obviously we learn through simply being human sinful ways we have this fallen human nature is it original in the sense that Adam and Eve were the first to indulge in it yes of course but beyond that I'm not so sure that we need to spell it out in further detail if there's something that you want to add to that by all means do write to us we'll, and we'll print what you have same with the atonement the atonement is certainly substitutionary and here we differ from the Sassinian Unitarians time of the Reformation they thought that the death of Jesus was merely a moral example. I think it's more than that. There is the idea of the shedding of blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. That's a basic principle in Hebrews. And then blood and water come out of the side of Jesus when he dies. Both water and blood are cleansing elements, clearly. Water and blood. And so there's a cleansing that has to go on. And that happened because Jesus bore our sins in our place. He died in place of us in Mark 10 there. There's a substitutionary element, but I don't think we need to try to analyze that to death more than to realize the various uh, occasional sayings which bear on this subject. But I think that we have not done enough in our emphasis on the one God and the kingdom, which are absolutely central. I think personally I've not done enough with the high priest priesthood of Jesus in Psalm 110, which we make much of, verse 1, but verse 4, Jesus is the high priest. He's our intermediary. He's the spokesman for God, the man Messiah, the intermediary between God and man. And we need to concentrate on that aspect of his current activity more than we have. So I hope that helps a little bit. Yeah, the question also has uh, someone leaning towards Christos Victor. Can you explain what that um, Christos Victor is? Without looking that up, I've forgotten. Is that Arlen, the author? I've forgotten the detail of that, so I'm not going to attempt to define it without a little preparation. But okay. Unless you want to remind us the, the source of that question, what is the Christos Victor theory in a nutshell? Yeah, the, uh, the uh, questioner mm -hmm. is Christos mm -hmm. Victor. Yes. Christus Vig the theory of atonement where Christ's death defeated mm -hmm. the powers of evil. Yes. Uh, it's a model of the atonement that is dated to the church fathers. Yes. Uh, also called ransom theory. Was the dominant theory of the atonement yeah. for a thousand years until okay. Anselm of Canterbury yes. supplanted okay. it in the West with his satisfaction theory yes. of atonement. I, I think there are elements of that probably that are right and probably elements that are wrong. The, the atonement is a multifaceted <coughs> thing. It's not systematically laid out anywhere. Certainly the ransom was not paid to the devil. That's quite wrong. The Jehovah's Witnesses say that a ransom was paid to the devil. That is clearly wrong. Is there propitiation as well as expiation? Probably, but those terms would have to be defined. I think on the whole people make too much of all this. It's sufficient to say that Jesus died in our place without the remission, I'm sorry, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Also, blood is necessary for the ratification of a covenant. That's most important. No covenant 
including the new covenant, can be ratified, brought into force without the shedding of blood. And that's exactly what Jesus did in Luke 22. He goes to the cross with these words, that he's shedding his blood to inaugurate the uh, covenant, the new covenant, based on his words, just as the words of Moses were all in place before they dipped the words in blood, so to speak, and put blood on the people to initiate that covenant. So exactly then Jesus initiates the new covenant with blood based on his words, because there's a fearsome notion out there that somehow the teaching of Jesus doesn't count for us. That is the greatest catastrophe, I think, in New Testament understanding of all, that Jesus spoke only to Jews. That's fundamentally false. His words went first to Jews. That's true. Paul expanded on some of the topics that Jesus did not fully expand on himself, but that faith goes first to Jews and then equally to Gentiles. The missing element in your thinking out there often is that the gospel of the kingdom was somehow for Jews under Jesus. That is fundamentally wrong. The great insight of the Abrahamics was that they saw that in Acts 28, the same salvation gospel of the kingdom goes to the Gentiles exactly as it had gone to the Jews first of all. Acts 20, verses 24 and 25, I'm slightly off topic here, but this is so important. Acts 20, verses 24 and 25, the gospel of the grace of God is absolutely a synonym for the gospel of the kingdom of God. The whole offer of salvation is with a view to producing a kingdom, candidates for immortality, candidates for royal office in the kingdom. So going to heaven when you die is a disaster in the system must be dropped. Even the phrase eternal life is much too fuzzy, foggy, and vague. It's the life of the age to come. And in that kingdom life, the first stage of the kingdom being the millennium, the saints are now being groomed for royal office. First Corinthians 6, 2, don't you know the saints are going to manage the world, not judge the world, but manage the world. This is fundamental to the gospel of the kingdom. So you're getting a truncated gospel. Yes, people understand that Jesus died for their sins and they're forgiven. Yes, that's fine. All fine and good. But what does this lead to? The gospel of the kingdom, the word of the kingdom, the parable of the sower unpacks all that. That's the element that's missing in the scheme out there and needs to be rectified and restored. How would this, uh, since we're in the atonement, can you comment on the Isaiah passage 53:11? Yes. After he has suffered, yeah. he will see the light of life yes. and be satisfied Absolutely. by his knowledge. A yes. righteous servant will yes. justify many, Marvelous. and he will bear their iniquities. Yes. Can you just comment on the atonement yes. and the significance of the atonement in relation to this knowledge? Of well, they all go together. He does bear the sins of many. That's wonderful. I'm glad that was raised because he bears the <laughs> sins. He takes that penalty on himself as an act of compassion and love within the scheme of God. God ordained that the shedding of blood is necessary for the remission of sins. I can understand that. Blood is the life. Life, death, and blood all go together. You shed your blood, you give your life, you're giving the utmost. That's why this uh, shedding of blood occurs in the ratification of covenants too. It's the way of saying, I give my all, my totality, on behalf of someone else. I do it in place of. Now, obviously, Jesus did not take the penalty of the lake of fire, so it's a symbol. It's not exactly a quid pro quo, one thing exactly for the other, but it is indeed a symbol then of God's wrath being also propitiated. I think that element is there. In a couple of cases you get Moses beseeching God, don't kill these people. Abraham beseeching God, please don't wipe them all out. Phineas, you know, in the Psalms, interposes so there is an element, I would say, in this multifaceted picture, but it's when one element gets uh, exaggerated to the uh, loss of the others that we get out of, out of uh, sync with the doctrine. However, the gospel of the kingdom must firstly be stated. People have to repent and believe in the kingdom. That's Mark 1, 14 and 15. Without belief in the kingdom, there is no remission of sins. There's no repentance. Can I, uh, yes. just for people's... Uh Mm -hmm. So you're, I think you're alluding to Hebrews 9. Yes. Uh, I'll just read the passage. Yes, 922. Nine. That is why the first covenant was mm -hmm. established with blood. Marvelous. After Moses had given all the commandments of the law to everyone, he took the blood of the calves and goats, and together with water, Excellent. scarlet wool, and hyssop, yes. sprinkled the 
book itself, the mm. Torah. I guess. Mm. He said to them, "This is the blood of the covenant relationship which God desires to have with you." Yes. Moses sprinkled the blood in the same way on the tabernacle and everything used in worship. Yes. According to ceremonial law, so this is established by yes. God. Yes. Yes. Almost everything is made clean with yes. blood, and without shedding blood, yes. nothing is made ritually free yes. from the stain of sin. Yes. So, what you're Excellent. saying is that this is why Christ yes. had to die. Absolutely. Because that's the question, I think, yes. at the center of the atonement. Yes, indeed it is. And that's, that's really very that's good. That's the there. answer. Pretty I much. noticed there that as you read that, we have water <laughs> and blood in that ceremony too. That's excellent. Here's the analogy I've been, I've been giving to the students over the years that I taught at Atlanta Bible College. I've suggested this, that supposing you have a little lamb that's very sick at birth and you, you uh, treat it in such a gentle way that it survives the threat of death when it's very young and it grows up to be a strong and healthy lamb, and then you tell a whopping lie to your parents. And that means then that you are required to kill that lamb and you would have to slaughter that lamb and you would realize then what that lamb means to you so God then who loves his son in an indescribable way a way we cannot fully understand as human beings certainly is asked then to allow that son that beloved son to die on behalf of others that's something like the picture there's nothing deeply philosophical about this it's a very realistic program as indeed of course the whole Bible is simple realism Jesus was not a philosopher. He knew nothing about essences and hypostases and so on. And the problem we're dealing with is that the church fathers from the second century muddled this whole thing up in terms of defining God and couched it then in phraseology brought from the world of Greek philosophy. That's the disaster. What would you say to the argument that so your God is a bloody God, a God that requires the shedding of, isn't that you know bad yeah. Some people might not say. if God ordains it it's not you may not like it <laughs> that's your problem the God of the Bible has ordained that blood which is the symbol of life life is everything the wages of sin is death. death God constitutes it that way sin is so horrible so horrifying so abhorrent that we have to make the ultimate fuss over sin this requires then the shedding of blood, death. The wages of sin is death. That's God's constitution. The covenant then is his arrangement to be in league with us. The whole point of the Bible being God and his relationship to man for the creation of immortal human beings. That's the part of the story that's missing. And so when that's missing, the whole concentration is on the death and resurrection of Jesus, central as that is, it's completely meaningless without the ultimate goal, which is the inheritance of the kingdom, which comes at the second coming when the saints of all the ages, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the faithful of all the ages, get to rule the world and fix the world on a grand scale. And my goodness, are we seeing an interest in that in the current discussion of the election? Everybody, I say, wants to fix the world. Well, guess what? The saints are going to fix the world. Okay, moving on. Do lineages, yes. lineages yes. have to go through the Father in the Bible in order for Jesus to be a descendant of David? Well, Do they have to? yes. <coughs> the point would be that the case of Jesus is unique. The story is quite clear that Joseph was not his father physically. In that case, if you're going to trace his lineage to David, you'd have to go through the mother. So. In, in general, of course, that's true. The lineage is traced, uh, I think, not now in Judaism, but it was traced through the Father. That's fine. But you cannot argue from that that there isn't a virgin birth. I don't think that's what the question is saying. In the case of Jesus, Jesus it makes perfect sense. The, the lineage, whether that be in Luke or Matthew, I recommend you, if you want to get into this, read The Genealogies of Jesus Christ by Lord Harvey. A famous uh, difficult to obtain piece I may be online now it's online it's online that's one Google books it's possible it's a Google book that's wonderful Carlos is telling me that it's possible that Mary and Joseph had a common grandfather they would be first cousins we don't know that for sure perhaps you can prove it work could be done on that but I think that Mary for sure has to be related 
by blood lineage because of Psalm 132, Psalm 89, a lineal descendant of David is the only person who can qualify as the Messiah. So he must be that. And I think then in the case of Jesus, this is unique. So we cannot argue from that unique case uh, to prove that it has to be one thing or the other in the case of every other human being. What's interesting to me is that no one denied that this Jesus was of the no, that's house a good of point. David. I mean, no, they didn't. They didn't have issues no. with there is a famous error where scholars have talked about Psalm 110.1 where Jesus says, whose son is the Messiah? And the idea, preposterous as it is, is that Jesus is doubting whether the Messiah has to be the son of David. Right. Jesus is said to be saying quite wrongly. I mean, this is a, a prestigious error on the part of commentary, saying that Jesus is doubting the sonship of David the Messiah. No, no, you so can't. De you can't deny that. That is that is intrinsic to the whole biblical He's story. He's testing them. He's, He's testing them. He's not saying, right. "I'm going to be the Lord of David, but I'm not the son of David." That's just out of this world bad, extremely bad, because the whole point of messiahship is he's related uh, linearly to King David. Okay, moving on. Uh, who is the speaker? At Revelation 22 9, mm -hmm. which is the part about the angel, I think an angel. Yes. Uh, if we can pull that up. Revelation 22, verse 9. Which says, He said to me, Do not do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours. And, and Titus 2 13. Oh. Okay, that one is not so people. hard. Let's start with the Titus one. That's the glory of the great God and of our Savior Jesus Christ. There's a, I think, quite unnecessary argument grammatically there to try to show that Jesus is called God. We don't need that. He's called God twice for sure in the New Testament. The Father, tell your friends, is called God or the God very often, the one God, 1300 times. This is fundamental to any discussion of who God and Jesus are. It's really absurd to say that the Son is equally God when the Father is called God 1,300 <coughs> times and the Son is referred to as God twice, once in Hebrews where immediately God is on top of that God. If you have a God, you are not God. This is quite easy. So that one in Hebrews quoting Psalm 45 is quite clear. A messianic use of the word God, even in the NAB Bible, you have a little g on that God there. The other one in Thomas, of course, is famous and quite clear. Eventually, Thomas sees what he didn't see in chapter 14, where Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen God, not meaning he is God. That would then overthrow the entirety of biblical monotheism, but rather that God is in Christ. The difference is very clear. God is not Christ. Christ is not God. That's really an unbelievably complicated and difficult thing that got us into terrible trouble. Rather, God is in Christ reconciling the world to himself. It's a very different thing. You know, uh, just a quick yep. comment. If you go back to Titus 1. Yes. Uh, the God there is, yes. it actually says God our Savior. Yes. And it's always, def they're always distinct. They're always two people. Oh, absolutely. So God, yes. it says, I'm yep. a servant of God yes. and an apostle of yes. Jesus. Yes. And then the famous greetings grace yes. and peace from God yes. the Father right. and Christ Jesus, yes. our Savior. Of course. So they're both, they're both saviors. titled saviors. Of course. But they're titles, they're, they're not on. None of this was a problem until yeah. Psalm 110, verse 1, was ditched. I want to tell you an interesting <laughs> thing, that in the New American Standard updated version in the margin in Acts 2.34, where Peter's quoting Psalm 110, 1, the Lord said to my Lord, in the margin of the 1995 copy of the New American Standard Bible that I'm using here, they have a saying, uh, a figure one against that second Lord, and they say the Hebrew word here is Adonai. It's false. I wrote to them, and I was happy to see when somebody bought that Bible, I hadn't, I hadn't noticed this, from the same year, there must have been another printing in that year. They took that out. That must be, I would think, the only error of language made in the margin of the New American Standard Bible, which is normally very accurate, anywhere. The word there is not Adonai. This would be God. 449 times Adonai is the Lord God, never addressed to a man. However, 195 times, Adonai, my Lord, little L should be, 
is a non-deity title. So Psalm 110.1 will yet change the world. You can have a whole ministry on this. Point out that Yahweh, who's one person, speaks in oracle to Adonai, my Lord, little L-O-R-D, all 195 times of that word. So they're both saviors. They st they're both saviors. Point. Titus 1 of course. calls God our Savior, yes. verse 3. And then verse 4 says, Christ Jesus our Savior. Of course. They're both... Moses was a savior figure. Of course. The, the uh, judges are called saviors. They I are. Think, in the they are, and also in Nehemiah, you'll find Nehemiah, those, those right. in, in, in Nehemiah. This is not hard. You have presidents of the bank, you have presidents of this, that, and the other, you have the president of the United States. This right. is very easy. People get hung up on one word and they say, there is called God, therefore he must be God. This is shatteringly awful to the custodians of the Old Testament, the Jews who preserved the unitary monotheistic view of, of Israel, that God is a single, undifferentiated self, is the Yahweh, and show your friends this one, of Isaiah chapter 64, <coughs> verse 15, where the prophet there says, You, Yahweh, are our Father. That's one person. As in Malachi 2.10, Do we not all have one Father? Has not one God created us? Yahweh is a single person in Scripture, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of times with singular personal pronouns. He's never tripersonal, always one person, and those marvelous statements like our Father, equivalent to our God, not our Yahweh. You can't say our Yahweh, it's a personal name, but Yahweh, the personal name of a person, the confusion that was wrought when we started saying that God is not a person but a what, an usia, a being, is indescribable. We need to get behind all that, go back to the New Testament and speak the simple language of unitary monotheism. Right, the other one was about Revelation 22. Yes. And it says, I am coming soon. Yes. Blessed are those who obey the words <coughs> of this prophetic book. Yes. So that's someone speaking. And then I, John, yes. heard and saw these visions. Yes. When I heard and saw them, I fell down at the feet of the angel Mm -hmm. who had revealed these things to me yes. to worship him. Yes. He, the angel, mm -hmm. said, warned me, mm -hmm. do not do that. I am one of God's servants, mm -hmm. just as you are, together with your brothers and sisters, the prophets, and those who obey the commands written in this book, yes. worship God. Yes. So that's clearly the angel. Clearly. Right but the angel speaks for God, and sometimes it isn't <coughs> clear whether it's the angel or God. It doesn't matter. One is an agent for the other. And when it comes to the A to Z, the Alpha to Omega, Jesus is the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last in chapter, one who died. Nobody thought God could die. There are certain defining characteristics of personages in the Bible. One who dies is not a human, who is a human being. God is immortal. Anything by way of death, the Son of God, for instance, who died, God's Son who died in Romans 5, automatically puts himself outside the category of God. Therefore, the hymn which says, "'Tis mystery all, the immortal dies," is sheer nonsense, with great respect to Charles Wesley. It really doesn't do us any good to break the laws of simple logic and grammar and talk about the immortal God who dies, much less about the Messiah who had a beginningless, or the Son of God who had a beginningless beginning. This doesn't make the slightest sense Drop it, and you'll find the book, the Bible, becoming clearer in a brilliant new way. Well, the book of Revelation itself starts by saying that uh, that God made known to yes. John these things by the angel yes. of Jesus. Yes, the angel. Well, the angel was sent to Jesus as the agent of God. Well, let me read the yeah. revelation from yeah. Jesus, yes. which God gave him. Yes, which God gave. Jesus. Jesus, yes. So, how can you be that? Right. No. To show his, and then Jesus in yeah. turn sends yes. his angel yes. to his servant John. Of course. So, there's always a, clear. a clear right. um, it's a line of command. Line of command, yeah. The omniscient God doesn't <coughs> need a revelation, and Jesus is given the revelation there. Even the exalted Jesus, the Psalm 110 1, the Adonai, my Lord, little L there. This will clear up so much once we get back to the unitary unipersonal monotheism of Israel. Okay, next question. Is the Holy Spirit a created being, I'm assuming this person means yes. distinct from God the Father, 
or just an impersonal force? Well, it's, okay, that's an interesting question. This is not so hard. The question was put by Alan Richardson in his Theology of the New Testament, which has stuck with me. Let me ask you this question in response. Is the spirit of Elijah a different person from Elijah, or what? Obviously not a different person. The spirit of Elijah is the operational, energizing power and personality of Elijah. Elijah in operation. In the same way, the spirit of God is not a different person from God. It's God in his operational presence, and likewise for Jesus. The Bible makes no distinction as far as I can see, between the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Jesus, they're indistinguishable in their effects on us. Certainly not a third person, and certainly not impersonal. Very personal, because Spirit is the personality projected. So that would be the clear answer to that. I dealt with that in both of my uh, Trinity books. And this is well done in many, many textbooks. The Spirit of Elijah is not a different person. The Spirit, of course, is never worshipped. The Spirit is God in spirit. The Spirit of Jesus operated to prevent them in one place in Acts from going to a certain region. God in his operational, or Jesus in his operational presence and power, very personal, not a third person. Right, and, and the Spirit is also identified with Jesus himself, as we know. In some passages, it makes no difference First, whether you say Jesus yeah. is acting, his Spirit is acting, the Lord is the Spirit. That's to say, the Spirit of the Lord is operating. So when you're experiencing that Spirit of the Lord, you're experiencing Jesus. This is not hard until we start chopping into little pieces, as we tend to do in the West. Think... Uh, more globally, think more totality. in totality totality. and you'll be near to the mind of Christ. Of course, I mean, the mind of Christ is the same as the spirit of Christ in one place too. Right. So spirit is very closely related to words because you are expressing yourself in words. Your spirit is expressed in words, most important. Yeah, a key verse is uh, Corinthians 15. Yep. Uh, scripture says the first man, Adam, became a living person. Yes. The last Adam, yep. human being, yep. both human beings. Both human beings. But the last one is interesting because yes. he becomes mm -hmm. a life imparting spirit. Excellent. He's and then the key that. verse 46 yep. the spiritual did not come first, right. but the natural. That's exactly the, the right order. The spiritual came after. There's always an order, isn't there? There's an, always an order. Adam <laughs> precedes Jesus, not the other way around. And he's Jesus now, the risen, immortalized Jesus. The Bible being the story of God's enormous program to immortalize human beings, he's done it with Jesus only so far, by resurrecting him and putting him at the right hand of the Father, and that Jesus now is a life-imparted spirit person. He has a spiritual body. He had that when he showed up after the resurrection, and he's not uh, just a spook, a ghost. He is corporeal, tangible, palpable, and can eat, and still walk through walls and other capacities. We don't know the detail of all that, but Paul talks about a pneumaticon soma, a spiritual body. That takes a little bit of getting our minds around, but it's certainly corporeal and recognizable. Individuals are recognized in the kingdom when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets, they're recognized for who they are and who they will always be. Well, can we look at it this way, that in effect, for the moment, mm. God the Father has delegated everything to the Son, basically. So now the Son is the one who searches, it says, Revelation, the hearts of all human no beings. No question. Uh, Jesus himself says in Matthew 28, mm -hmm. all authority yes. in heaven and on earth has been. So in a, in a certain sense, yes. God the Father because of the victory of his son yes he's so delighted in yes. the son and the son is so capable now Good that point. he has delegated yes all the activities of the one god the father Certainly. to the son and i think that's what jesus is getting at in mm -hmm. passages like john 14 mm -hmm. where it says i'm coming back you know mm -hmm. he he speaks about himself in a third person yes. because he will take on as it were yes. the activities Mm -hmm. of God the Father through, obviously, the one spirit. Is that a way of looking at it? Well, that's certainly right. And so 
the delegation, <coughs> the agency principle, is the one that conquers all problems. And certainly none of us is saying that Jesus is just a mere man, whatever that's supposed well, to be. How can a mere man have all authority in the universe? That's ridiculous. Nobody's suggesting he's just an ordinary man, but we are suggesting he's not eternal God, which makes two gods. Yahweh is a single person, thousands upon thousands of An times. immortal human being is not just a, a mere, mere man. man. Just the fact that he's immortal. That's just just the slur. fact that he was raised from the dead. Of course. Cannot make you a mere man. And, and okay, sat at the right on. hand of the father is not just a mere man. No. Okay, this is uh, can a remarried man, just mm -hmm. going off a bit, can a remarried mm. man be involved in any ministry? If not, uh, what about after his first wife dies? And what about before and after? they become Christians. So in other words, if yes. they got divorced because... Well, so can, uh, you know. yes, that's not so hard. If his <coughs> wife is dead, he's free to remarry. A marriage is not binding beyond death. So if the man has lost a wife through death, of course he's completely free to operate in whatever capacity he can... In he the can church. In the, of course, in the right. church. Now the question would arise then, supposing he got married a second time, way back, my understanding would be that the past is the past. You have to take people on when they become believers. You take them on as where they are. You can't go back two or three marriages if necessary to try to unravel all that chaos. No, you start from scratch there. Now, the man who is married at that point, after a divorce even, should be faithful to that one wife. That's where you start. But I do not think that divorce is the unpardonable sin that prevents one from functioning as an elder forever. However, the elder should be a model of good faithfulness in marriage. That's quite clear. There has to be a level of repentance there. Though. Oh, in, in other words, if as a Christian yes. you do uh, divorce, yeah. well, I, I think it, it, it behooves us to define how we see the marriage and divorce well, yes. clause. Can you just yes, give a absolutely. It's quite clear to me that in 1 Corinthians 7, <coughs> two believers do not have a right to divorce and remarriage. The situation there is that if he or she should leave, God forbid, let them not get married to somebody else but be reconciled. That's quite clear. So let me repeat that. In 1 Corinthians 7, the two believers have no right to remarriage. They shouldn't ever get divorced. But should that, I mean, separate. I'm sorry, I correct myself. They shouldn't be separated. But if they should separate, they should not get married to somebody else. They should be reconciled. That's the ideal. However, if you have a situation where one is an unbeliever or has become an unbeliever even, then the believing partner does not have the need to keep that marriage together. I think he's then free to remarry. That would be the Pauline privilege there. That's as I understand it. Jesus, of course, was very tough on the notion that Moses had allowed for various reasons, not always quite clear, for divorce. And Jesus says, Moses conceded these stipulations because of the hardness of your heart. Let it not be said that in the Christian dispensation we can plead the same hardness of heart. We cannot. Jesus goes behind the legislation of Moses to an earlier stipulation in Genesis which is much tougher that what God has joined let nobody set apart, uh, set aside. However, Jesus then gives one exception, Pornia, which I take to be unfaithfulness of all sorts, any misdemeanors that go unrepented, that break the sexual bond of the marriage, that grants a divorce. And if you're divorced, I have to say, you're not married. Jesus is not asked about separation. He wasn't asked, well, can a man get separated for any reason? The question was about divorce. And divorce means you're not married. So with that one exception, Jesus forbids divorce. Paul probably allows it then where the unbelieving partner departs. But for two believers, be it noted very carefully in 1 Corinthians 7, 1 Corinthians 7 there is no right to remarriage as long as that partner is living. So, uh, you brought up this word pornia, which is translated fornication yeah. and adultery. Mm. So I think... Uh, we, no, we not, get... not, uh, to, not, not and older, adultery. Mm. Two so, different words in Greek. Some Ordinary translations have adultery? No, it's a different Never? word. 
Mihia is, is a different okay. one. However, in Jewish literature, they are sometimes used interchangeably. You'll find in Sirach 23, 23, a woman who commits adultery is committing pornia also. So, so the, the wording Matthew 19, I is think pornia. it is. Is pornia, yes. which means? Which means, in that setting, I think, unfaithfulness of any sort. Of any type. Yes. So, yeah. not just adultery, not just fornication, but... It's unfaithfulness. unfaithfulness. It's a sexual sin. Okay. It's a sexual sin. But it carries a broader <clears throat> meaning, for instance, than before marriage. Pornia. There is that stipulation. If a, if a woman is found not to be a virgin when she's married, mm -hmm. that's a special condition under Moses. Very unlikely that Jesus is simply repeating that. What he's talking about there is unrepented, um, continuing breaking of the sexual bond, which would be, I think, pornea. Because some people say, well, uh, amazingly enough, some people say it's not talking about fornication mm -hmm. as such. It's only talking about adultery. And then I've seen others say the opposite. Oh, no, it's adultery, not fornication. Well, if, it's, a, if it's in a marriage situation, we would call that adultery today. Right. I think in, in, in English today, adultery <coughs> means the breaking of the sexual bond in marriage. Jesus uses the strict word pornia, which is fornication, in this case, in this setting. Otherwise, it would really be impossible to know what he meant. It's, a, it's really almost a default position because it would mean unfaithfulness in a marriage situation which here and in other places in Jewish literature can be called pornia, although it is strictly, if you like, mihia, that's the word for adultery. This would be a fairly standard evangelical point of view that I, that I suggested. Uh, Keegan Chandler, is yeah. on, he wants a follow-up to this. Yeah. Uh, basically, uh, he wants to know God's attitude towards the patriarchs then because if in the New Testament we have monogamy yeah. Uh, yeah. as an absolute what about in the Old Testament where polygamy was yes. allowed right. how he just wants your comment on oh I see what well it was allowed God's attitude? God, no, God allowed that he didn't I think in the New Testament it's against the law of the land of course that settles it very easily for us but God can do that yes David had lots of wives it's true was that found or not? No, I don't, don't think so at all. It certainly wasn't illegal. It may not have been the ideal. However, nothing is said about that. I simply take the New Testament as it is, so we don't need to worry about being polygamous now. That's out of the question, and even the law of the land forbids it, thankfully, so it's not a problem for us. Well, it's interesting that Jesus yeah. goes back to the garden. Yes. And he says, yes. yes, you have done this. That's right. But yes. it wasn't supposed yes. to be this way in other words so in other words yes. I think Jesus mm. is implying that yes God allowed you a, a divorce certificate from Moses that's the issue of divorce whether he allowed polygamy because right. of the hardness of your heart is an op I, do, I don't know the answer to right. that I, I don't know it doesn't say I'm stuck with the rather simple data that in the New Testament obviously monogamy is required strongly uh, suggested by the Genesis account and but you're right God did allow for divorce for certain reasons right. because of the hardness so, of heart. It doesn't say he allowed polygamy because of the hardness of your heart. It could oh, be. Right. I don't uh, know yeah. that. Well, I it could be because Solomon, the example of Solomon yeah. is an interesting one. Well, right? yes. Where it was a was, disaster. Right. Um, a follow, Lorna says, why, so why would God's ideal yeah. include exceptions to kindness to each other in order to hurt each other? Uh, I don't understand sure. the question. Yeah, exactly. Right. If you can clarify, uh, yeah, clarify that, Lorna. God's ideal was created in the garden. Yes, the, the ideal was was uh, marriage forever, yeah. uh, monogamy clearly. Now, certainly, there's a concession under Moses to the hardness of heart. Exactly what the reasons are not always clear, but Jesus goes beyond all that, takes us back to the Genesis account, and says, from now on, then. With the sole exception in Matthew 19 of Pornia, which I'm taking to be unfaithfulness, which is continued without repentance and so on. It can be forgiven and marriages can be restored. That's the ideal. But if that doesn't happen, then a divorce takes place, at which point then you're not married if you're divorced. Okay, moving on. Uh, yeah. uh, what's your take on the New Testament's different accounts of the empty tomb and resurrection appearances <laughs> now yeah. this person is asking because they have watched uh, some uh, uh, 
debates slash conversations uh -huh. with people like Bart Ehrman. I see. Where they're arguing that, you know, the accounts differ and, and what, so what do you take? Well, I, I, I've different? seen what George Ladd did with uh, <coughs> trying to reconcile those. It honestly doesn't matter to me. The fact is the resurrection happened. The rest is often evasion. Whether you have one, two angels and one, one angel or and one so on. woman or only who cares? Mary or... Who cares? The yeah. issue is for us, the Great Commission, is to teach the wide world that Jesus is alive, the resurrection happened. The rest tends to be tends to be a waste of time. Perhaps they're all reconcilable. One account, you know, picks out one angel. There were actually two, but that particular account didn't mention the second one. And on and on. I think you could waste a lot of time with that. But George Ladd, I remember in the book, I believe in the resurrection, was that the title uh, did attempt to reconcile all that. Perhaps that works, but it's not something that I've really spent enough time with. Are Good we, question, nevertheless. We've we got some time here. You want to yeah. share something from God Incarnate? Uh, yes, I was just looking at um, the famous myth of God Incarnate in 1980. This is some yeah. essays following that, God Incarnate Story in Belief. Here very fascinating title there was uh, uh, the debate continued you should know about the myth of god incarnate interesting reading the debate yeah. continued i have them here somewhere and then further essays god incarnate story and belief my point here is that in the 80s they really began to say what sense does it make that god became a man literally and they're questioning all that now you can always say well they're all liberals they're unbelievers and so on However, that's dangerous. It doesn't mean, because a man hasn't got the proper faith in other areas, that everything he says is wrong. Boltman, I disagree with thoroughly when he demythologizes the New Testament, gets rid of things like resurrection. To me, that's quite absurd. He just unraveled the entire story, and that will not work. However, Boltman did say some interesting things. He says this, The formula, Christ is God, that formula, Quote, Christ is God what is page, false. What page is this? This is on page 76 of mm -hmm. God Incarnate Story and Belief in the article by John Macquarie, the essay, essay by John Macquarie. Boldman said, The formula Christ is God is false in every sense in which God is understood as an entity which can be objectified, whether you call it an Aryan or Nicene system or Orthodox or the literal sense, it's incorrect to say God, or Christ rather, is God. However, he goes on to say, it's correct to say Christ is God. If you understand the word God, to mean the event of God's acting, and he says a similar thing in another writing, Boltman does, if the proclamation of the word, little w, is a continuation of the Christ event, then the conception as a whole leads to the affirmation, the correct one, Boltman says, that Christ is himself the Word. I think that's right. Jesus, as he walked around, is the expression of God. God was in Christ, not God was Christ. It's when you double up on two gods that you're in trouble. You've got this intractable problem that you have a God who remains in heaven in the Orthodox system, and a God who walks the earth, and that's not two gods. It sounds awfully like two gods. You don't need that. You simply say that God expresses himself in his word, and in due course, having spoken, as it says in Hebrews 1 so beautifully, throughout the prophetic time, right up to Malachi, God spoke in various ways, various systems, various parts and places. He spoke in the prophets and so on. However, in these last days, since the coming of the Son, he spoke in the Son. He didn't speak in the Son before that. And therefore the Son comes into existence, as Matthew and Luke labor to tell us. And that's where you should start all of your Christological studies, with Matthew and Luke, where quite plainly they are uh, very strongly opposed to the idea of a so-called pre-existing Son. Nobody can imagine that Luke, in his account of what the angel said to Mary and so on, and similarly in Matthew, nobody could possibly imagine, and Raymond Brown does this so well in his birth narratives book, a classic, the, which, is, up there, which is also here, I think, somewhere. Um, it's called The Birth of Messiah. You've got a marginal Jew there. I've got masses of stuff in Christology here, but the one, I think, by Raymond Brown is upstairs birth of right the now. Messiah, right. 
The both of them sides upstairs. Yeah. Anyway, he says repeatedly that in Matthew and Luke, <coughs> Matthew and Luke are not describing the arrival of a God the Son through the womb. They're talking about the procreation, the generation, the bringing in to existence of the Son of God. That's Luke 135. Because of the miracle wrought in Mary, the one to be begotten in her, Matthew 120. Notice, begotten in her womb, fathered, sired, engendered, brought into existence in her womb, will be called the Son of God. That is the biblical definition of Son of God. It's a human being, in the case of Jesus, uniquely and specially procreated, engendered, sired, fathered in the womb of a young virgin. That's not so hard, and I suspect that the Gospels, Matthew and Luke, were written with the express purpose of staving off the later idea that there was a God the Son who entered the womb from outside. Uh, Justin Martyr, of course, speaks of a pre-existing Son, not in a Trinitarian sense yet, but he speaks about God begetting a Son before Genesis. It's when we get to Barnabas, a post-biblical book, that for the first time we learn wrongly, of course, that 126 of Genesis speaks of God speaking to his son. The first occurrence of that text, misused horribly, I think, is in Barnabas, not a biblical book. And so very soon after the, uh, the ink is dry on the New Testament documents, this pagan notion of a God the Son, eventually he was God the Son, first of all he's an Aryan created son, created before Genesis. Later that isn't taken to be sufficient, so they move to God the Son, and you have the whole Trinitarian problem, which took 400 years and more, 451 years and more, to settle. And the argumentation, the killing, the excommunication, all of what went on there, to be read in the book called The Jesus Wars by Philip Jenkins, is, I think, a terrible testimony to the confusion and chaos that happened when the unitary monotheistic Shema, the creed of Jesus agreeing with the Jew, was abandoned. And the church fathers themselves admit that they rejected the Jewish creed. That's alarming. What if they rejected the creed of Jesus, whose words are our judge, whose words are the gold standard in Christianity? The epitome of faith is the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, repeated by Jesus, that the Lord our God is one person, one singular, singular undifferentiated person. Sorry, uh, Randy had a last question yes. here. Um, are we now par are we now partakers of the Commonwealth of Israel? Ephesians oh, yes. two twelve question. Yes. If so, yes. is there a mm -hmm. distinction difference between Israel according to the flesh uh, and yes. the e and the spiritual Israel? Oh, I'm guessing the Galatians. Absolutely, that's a great question. Of course, Israel after the flesh uh, in the King James correctly translated there. I think in First Corinthians ten eighteen is it. Um, Israel according to the flesh. That means lineal, biological, fleshly Israel is the nation of Israel, not the church. And that is a reference clearly then to what we would call now blinded, uncomprehending Jews as we see it because they have not accepted the Messiah who has come. That is quite distinct from the Israel of the Spirit. The spiritual Israel is of course in Galatians 6.16 the church there is addressed as the Israel of God, God's people spiritual circumcision in Philippians 3 3 quite clear for Paul then the international believing church having the doctrines that Paul recognized as the faith is the spiritual Israel the Commonwealth of Israel the new international church however that is absolutely not to the exclusion of a future national conversion of now unbelieving Jews all of that is in Romans 9 to 11 and Paul says until a certain quota of Gentiles has come in, when that has come in, until that end point, the full quota of Gentiles come in, then he says, thus Israel will be saved. The until there, of course, implies, and then all Israel, not every Israelite just by being a Jew, but every converted, repentant Jew who accepts Messiah probably under the stress of the great tribulation to, through which they will have to go, then there will be a remnant of the nation of Israel existing into the millennial period with Isaiah speaking in Isaiah 19 of Egypt my people, Assyria my people, and Assyria will be the inveterate enemies of Israel before the second coming of Jesus, 
but those will be national entities, including my people, Israel. Those are mortals surviving as mortal population over whom the now international Israel of God will be supervising as managers. First Corinthians 6, 2, Revelation 2, 26. To those who overcome, I will give them, Jesus said, the same power that God gave to me, Jesus, namely to rule the nations with a rod of iron, Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is indispensable information for getting the narrative, the story correct. Um, and obviously, uh, Paul says in Galatians 3 that in Messiah there is no absolutely. distinction. That's cre uh, absolutely. Galatians so uh, 3.29 is, is vitally important. Clear, yeah. It doesn't matter what nationality you're born into, there's no distinction. You are all seed of Abraham. Notice then that Genesis 12 applies to the current seed of Abraham. You're blessed by being the seed of Abraham. Not by being an unverted Jew. Can, That's can where Zionism gets that wrong. These verses are yes. incredible. Yes. Not just uh, for the society at the time, which right. was very class yes. oriented. Yes. Not just with religious people. Right. With secularists mm -hmm. or pagans. So this this passage, mm -hmm. this is quite a progressive oh, thing by the former Jew, mm. a Pharisee, a Absolutely. Pharisee, I mean, um, Complete change of a mind. rabbi, a rabbi, yes. he called himself. Yes. So he says, for you are now all God's children. Yes. Through your belief in Messiah Jesus, yes. there is always a, yes. a condition. uh, conditional, of it's conditional, right? Yes. All of you who were water baptized, yes. very important, yes. we have to get water baptized yes. into Messiah, yes. have clothed yourselves with Messiah. Yes. So there is no longer, yes. so once all those conditions are met, there's no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free. We had slaveries up until recently. Mm -hmm. So again, a very progressive uh, teaching mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. No male or female. Yes. Again, That's right. no, no, no distinction no in the distinction sexes. At all. Back in the day where women right. were treated very... Poor you are son. all united yeah. mm -hmm. as one mm -hmm. in Messiah Jesus, mm -hmm. and if you belong to Messiah, and then if this wasn't progressive enough mm -hmm. from a Jewish rabbi, yep. he throws in this verse from the Old Testament. Of then you are Abraham's children, yes. heirs of the promise. Yes. Isn't that incredible? Of the promise that it was exclusive yes. to one na nation, well, one race in, in Genesis Terrific 18. Right. Now he says, no, you can all partake now. Heirs of the promise of the kingdom of the earth, wow. the, the promise of the kingdom rule when Christ returns. That's a, a very high note, I think, to end on, a very good so, sorry, just a couple of last ones yep. here, because Keegan uh, threw in uh, some mm. interesting. Just to go back yes. to the uh, polygamy yes. and the monogamy yeah, okay. of the. What does Keegan have to say? He threw in a passage here in Deuteronomy 17. Okay. Uh, these are commandments to the king by by God. Yeah. Uh, so he says, uh, "Do not place a foreigner over you." one who is not an Israelite, the king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for right. himself, <laughs> or make the people return to Egypt yes. to get more of them, yes. for Yahweh has told you, you are not to go back that way again. Yeah. He, the king, yes. must not take many wives, yes. or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver yes. and gold. So That's obviously it. that was not that's the good. case with one called yes. Solomon. <laughs> that's that's a, a good point. So there's a negative aspect of polygamy, presumably in every case, uh, but the rule quite clearly now is monogamy in a Christian setting. That's a good point. Thank you to, to Keegan for that. Uh, maybe I could just announce the title of Keegan's book. What is it? Yes. Remind us of the title of the upcoming book. The God of Jesus yes. uh, in light of... Dogma. Yes, he says uh, he's still working on mm -hmm. this, what I call, tome. Yes. Uh, now it's nearing 600 pages, he Ooh. tells me. <laughs> so it's getting, uh, yeah. you got to stop, Keegan, at yes, some point. Yes, <laughs> books become a little bit unreadable if they're too long. However, yeah. this is going to be a very valuable document. The God of Jesus in the light of Christian, Christian dogma. dogma. Yeah. Very interesting indeed, and will put a lot yes. of things to rights, as they say in England clarify a lot of 
terrible confusion about the God of Israel and the position of Jesus as Messiah. Right, it's basically two sections. The first dealing with the history of yes. the whole Orthodox right. situation, how we ended up with yes. what we got. Yes. And then the second part, it's a theological, more exegetical of treatise of... Of course. It's an excellent Yes, poem. as long as you all remember to remain with Luke 2.11, the one born in the city of Bethlehem is the Messiah Lord, the anointed Lord. I was appalled to find Henry Alford in his otherwise very interesting commentary saying this was Jehovah Lord. That is absolutely fundamentally false. It's the Messiah Lord, the Christos Kyrios there, a phrase found in the Psalms of Solomon and in other Jewish writings, very much part of the local Jewish background. He's the Messiah Lord, not the God Lord. There's only one God Lord, that's Yahweh the Father, Isaiah 64, 16. Show your friends that one.